We're searching for a hydrofoil that can allow us to fly farther. The longer we fly, the more we can take advantage of riding the wakes of many different boats on the lake. Instead of trying to find the elusive endless wave, we can want to create our own endless wave comprised of the wakes of passing boats. We've done plenty of learning through practice, reviewing more than 20 foils over the last eight months and sharing these reviews on YouTube. But we realized we need to go deeper and go back into the classroom. My accomplice is my friend and neighbor, Justin. Justin has challenged us to explore new types of foils, different techniques for foiling, and has been learning with me on this journey. We realized we have to go back to basics, back to first principles, and ask the question, how does a foil work? But before we jump back into the classroom, let's examine a video of a long distance marathon pumping session. In this video, I travel 600 meters in two and a half minutes. That's four meters per second. The front wing is the Axis 1150 and we know its dimensions. It has a span of 115 centimeters and a horizontal projected area of 1700 square centimeters. This wing has an aspect ratio of 7.7. .7. We'll get to what all these dimensions mean in a moment. Let's explore lift. The lift force is known. I'm 190 pounds, so that's about 860 newtons, including the weight of the board. The foil has to lift me and the board. The density of water is known. It changes a bit in salt water and at different temperatures, but it's not a big deal. Since we know my speed and the area of the front wing, we know everything except the lift coefficient, which we'll get to in a moment. But first, let's take a look at this equation. As the speed increases, the foil starts to generate a lift force. Even a small increase in speed increases the lift force by a lot because the speed is squared. Once you reach a certain speed, the lift force will exceed the weight of the rider and you take off. If we plug the numbers into the equation, we get a lift coefficient of 0.63. There are many airfoil modeling tools out there. I used airfoiltools.com. Each wing has a foil section. That's the teardrop shape you'd find if you cut the wing along its cord line. There's thousands of shapes. We'll just use the NAC of 4412 here. Each foil can be described by its thickness and its camber or curvature. The first four represents 4% 4 camber. The second four represents 40%. That's how far back from the leading edge the max camber happens at. And the last two numbers are the thickness in percent of total cord length and from these we can generate the curves we need. This is the shape of the lift coefficient for that foil section, and this tells us we need to fly this wing at 2 degrees angle of attack. This is idealized for a two-dimensional foil section. To be more exact, we need to apply a more complicated equation to correct for our real 3D wing, but let's just use this as an approximation. You can see what the foil looks like at different angles of attack. When it's steep, it generates more lift until it reaches a point at which it stalls and the flow separates. We learn to adjust the angle of attack as our speed changes to ensure we create the right amount of lift. We learn to pitch the nose down to generate less lift and pitch the nose up to generate more lift. When we're going fast, we actually reduce our lift coefficient by pitching the nose down. When we're going slowly, we need a high lift coefficient, so we pitch our nose up. As we're gliding, we're slowing down and losing speed. In order to maintain lift, we have to increase lift coefficient, so we pitch the nose up. But once we learn to fly, we realize that it's drag that holds us back. If we can reduce drag, we might be able to fly forever. Everything introduces drag. Our bodies pushing against the air in front of us, the mast, the fuselage, and rear wing under the water. But let's focus on the front wing for now. There's two factors that make up the drag. 
The first is the resistance created by the foil passing through the water. This is called viscous drag. This is the same resistance you feel as a biker when you ride your bike. The headwind is holding you back. The second is induced drag. This drag has to do with the shape of the wing and how much lifting the wing is doing. Since the pressure below the wing is higher, fluid flows around the wing tips, causing a swirling vortex. This means the wing tips don't really produce as much lift and the swirling that comes off the tips slows the wing down. If you've ever been sitting on a plane, looking out the window at the wing during takeoff, sometimes you can see vortices forming from water condensing out of the air. Here you can see a lift-induced vortex from the wing as a plane passes through smoke on a runway. The total drag is the sum of viscous and induced, but before we go further we need to introduce aspect ratio. Aspect ratio describes the shape of the wing plan or the surface of the wing. A glider has long narrow wings and thus a high aspect ratio. A fighter jet has short wide wings, thus a low aspect ratio. As it turns out, this matters a lot and we'll get to that. But first, how do you calculate it? For a rectangle, it's easy. Span divided by cord. For a real wing shape, it's a bit harder because the cord length changes across the span. Since cord is the area divided by the span, we can combine a few equations and get the span times the span divided by the area. So how can we reduce induced drag? Number one, high aspect ratio. Have a glider-like wing that has small tips and thus lower losses. Number two, a high efficiency factor. Have a wing surface shaped more like an ellipse. Let's show this in practice. You can see two very different wings here. Ideally, they'd be the same area, but the high aspect ratio wing has a little bit less area, but I think this still makes the point. You can see that the high aspect ratio glides further. Over the many tests I've done, I've always found the highest aspect ratio wings to glide further when all else is roughly equal. Okay, let's put this all together. We go back to airfoiltools.com and we know our angle of attack so we can calculate our drag coefficient. We can pull the viscous drag coefficient off the graph and it's 0.007. That's the lowest point. I guess the same way our bodies have learned how to find the angle of attack at each speed to keep us lifting, we've also found a pumping speed that minimizes drag. Now we can calculate the induced drag. We just calculated the lift coefficient, we know the aspect ratio, and we estimate the wing efficiency factor. The induced drag coefficient is 0.018. Now we just add these two coefficients up, and that's our total drag coefficient for the foil. We now plug everything into the drag equation, and we now know that we have 34 newtons, or 8 pounds, slowing me down. The drag equation tells us how much the water is holding us back. It has many of the same factors as the lift equation. As the area of the wing goes up, the drag goes up. As the velocity goes up even just a little bit, the drag goes way up because the velocity is squared. If we could go slower, the drag goes down, but we can't really go that much slower without losing lift. So what does this all mean? The foiler's lift is known. It's your weight, and there's an angle of attack you need to find at every speed. Drag matters a lot. Reducing it will let you pump longer and farther. But why does drag matter? We need enough speed to take off and fly, but once we're flying, we need to reduce drag as it steals energy. And to overcome the force, we need to exert power, like an engine of a car. Our engine is only so big and our engine can only run at peak power for so long. The way you calculate power is drag force times speed. So yes, drag force matters and we need to reduce it. But so does speed and we need to reduce that too. So how do we fly farther? Number one, lower drag coefficient foils. When pumping, we found the speed of minimum drag coefficient. So we need foils that can lower that coefficient further. Number two, larger area wings at slower speeds. 
power is a function of speed cubed, so the tiniest reduction in speed reduces our power exertion a lot, and we will need larger area wings to fly at that speed. Number three, high aspect ratio wings. Induced drag was bigger than viscous drag, so we need to lower the induced drag, and we can do that with larger wingspans. If we slow down, we don't need as much power. I'm reminded of a famous race, the tortoise and the hare. In that race, slow and steady won the race. Maybe this will be the case for foils. I rode my first high aspect wing six months ago. I feel like we're just at the beginning of a very interesting chapter of this sport. I do know we need to reduce drag as that's the force that's stealing energy from the pump and the aspect ratio and foil section can help. I also know that if we go a bit slower we can conserve energy and to do that we need a larger wing. I've been searching for the wing that unlocks three minutes of flat water pumping. It's been elusive, but I hope our learnings on the water and in the classroom can help us create an endless surf wave comprised of the wakes on the lake.